We welcome in Brian Munson of Husker Online. Brian, it is heating up here in Lincoln. Are you staying cool at all? Is it still hot down there in Texas? How are, how are you guys climate-wise? I think it was 103 on Saturday. We got oh, no. It was 98 only on Sunday. I think it's 94 today. Wow, it's like practically winter down there right now. Cool enough. Uh, it, it is. I was literally breaking out the uh, the flannel. Yeah, as you <laughs> as you called, I noticed that we didn't break ninety five yet, and I said, "Well, you know, I need to put my jeans on and grab my slippers and get the hot chocolate going." <laughs> <laughs> it's how you know football's in the air, right? It's finally cooling down. Yeah. Well, so yeah, and my son, my youngest son, uh, they started their football practices today. So um, football is definitely in, and actually UNK opened up their fall camp today too. So both kiddos are are back at it as of today. Wow, that's how you know we are getting close to football, Brian. Let's dive into uh, last uh, Saturday night, I should say, with Nebraska first here, real quick. Dylan Raiola, right? Seems like he's taking more and more steps to be quarterback one. Seems like he he's in the lead for that competition. Strick and I were talking about this, and I, I kind of want your thoughts on it as well. If Dylan Raiola is QB1, are you of the mind that, you know, Nebraska should ease him into the role, focus on on the run game, and kind of ease him in so, you know, by the time you get to midseason, he's more comfortable, and then you let him rip? Or is Dylan Raiola a good enough player, good enough prospect, and does Nebraska have enough around him that from the jump against UTEP, they can throw him into the fire and say, we trust you to be good, let it rip? Um. Well, I mean, obviously... <laughs> You want to be balanced, no matter what, and and you don't you don't want to act like you're breaking in a new quarterback. And I think that that's going to be one of the things that Matt Rule and his staff have got to be definitely aware of. Um, you know, when you go out there, you, you you may be a little vanilla, a little conservative, trying to just make sure you understand what it's like to, to play in front of eighty thousand people. Um, but I think that those I think those mittens stay on for about a half. Honestly, guys, mm. I, I think I think after that, it's um, it's a big boy game. I mean, you're playing in arguably, you know, one of the top two conferences in the country. You're playing, you know, for your, you know, for the Cornhuskers in front of in front of eighty, ninety thousand fans. Um, and I think that you know you were a five star quarterback for for a reason. You've been you've been kind of bred almost into basically being able to take your show from Buford, Georgia on the road to Nebraska and live inside the ultimate fishbowl, which is playing quarterback for the Cornhuskers. Um, he's handled it like a dude so far. Let's be honest. I mean, um, and, and I think that that's going to follow him to, you know, basically not having to keep the, the reins on him very long in the season. I think, I think Nebraska is going to be one of those teams. that's going to be fairly unpredictable anyway, because of all the, the various new faces and, and what they can possibly do with their team speed. And the defense should be very consistent from where it was at from a year ago. But I think that, you know, as time is going to roll on here and you do get to a little bit more of a comfortable level, I, I, I think that I think Raiola can really lead all of the energy around Nebraska. I think that, I think that that quarterback position and what kind of plays are able to generate to the playmakers outside. I and mean, let's be honest, we we're talking about Naor and, and Banks and Fedoni and, you know, and, and, and other dudes like Coleman and, and Lloyd that, you know, there's a lot of speed, a lot of talent, a lot of size at those, at those positions. And I don't think that they had those types of weapons a year ago. And, and obviously, I think it takes a little bit of the pressure off, you know, him. And honestly, I think the, the stable of running backs, it sounds like, you know, if we're talking about Johnson, you know, being the starting quarterback and, you know, you still have, and, and, and when I say Johnson, Emmett, not Ramir, and, you mm -hmm. know, you still have Gabe and you still have Dowdle back there um, and, and Ives for that matter. Uh, nice little, you know, stable of running backs too. It's about as good of a setup as they've had in, in Lincoln in quite a while. So I don't think that, I don't think the gloves are, I don't think that things are going to be very vanilla, you know, take it easy on the kid for, for too long. They, they need him to make some big boy decisions. They got a, they got a big time opponent coming, you know, early part of September, you know, Dion and Dion and the Buffaloes will be there and every, all the recruits, every single one of them I talked to from junior day, are all eyeing that weekend 
as a possible visit weekend. You cannot bring, you know, your top 2026 guys into Lincoln and not be basically running at a high level. I mean, that that's, that's, that's essentially what I'm thinking about right now. So I think that, I think they're going to have to get to it right away. Let me, let me switch the question a little bit, or at least the framing a little bit. I, I'm not saying Nebraska is going to go air raid if Dylan Raiola is that guy, but, but Brian, we know the one score losses over the last five, six, seven, however many years you want to go back. When I say, you know, let Dylan, let it rip. To me, it comes down to does Nebraska trust him in the biggest moments early? So recently mm-hmm. we've seen either the quarterbacks at Nebraska not have, you know, separators at the skill positions that they can get the ball to in those situations, or they don't trust the quarterback enough to get it to those guys. Do you feel like Nebraska has the guys at all those positions to when it's third and five, you know, maybe if the running back's the best guy for that situation, run the ball. But if the best play is, you know, Dylan Raiola, find an open man. Do you think that Nebraska will trust him enough early on to let it rip on a crucial third or fourth down? Or do you think mm-hmm. we see more of the same, you know, safe conservative Nebraska? You know, I think it's going to be more of the, more of the first part, more of the first scenario. I think that they're, I don't think that they're going to make a play, a play call in that down and distance that they haven't seen, you know, success from Raiola in practice and more of a live type of scenario playing against, you know, obviously other Huskers on the defensive side of the football, you know, either scout or some sort of, you know, uh, skelly type of situation. They're, they're going to call a play that they have seen him be successful before and that they know that they can kind of dig into that bag and say, he's comfortable doing this. And we should be able to go to this to pick up, you know, a third and short or third and intermediate and be able to get that one. And even if he doesn't, we know that he's capable of doing it. And and it's going to be either, it's going to be a completion and, and get the first down and maybe more, or it's going to be incomplete, but we, we don't believe that from a ball management, you know, perspective that this is going to be, you know, put into a bad spot where it's going to be an interception. I, I think that that type of play call is going to show up on the sheet. And that that's going to be something that's going to be in the coaches like back pocket. Like what are the go-tos for this down and distance, this down and distance, this down and distance based on these types of different various field positions. I think those are going to be some of the plays are going to want to have three, four, five in each one of those kind of categories there <clears throat> dialed up that they know that Dylan can execute. We're talking with Brian Munson of Husker online here on uh, 93.7, the ticket. couple five stars have been in town recently. Brian David Sanders Jr. we talked about, and then Michael Terry, the athlete, uh, also uh, on campus recently. Who do you think Nebraska has a better shot at, at convincing to come to Lincoln? Oh, I said before, I said I thought it was Sanders, and then I've uh, kind of kind of soured on that one lately. I'm so sorry to tell everybody that one. Hey, we need the um, truth. Give it to us straight. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that. Um you know, I, I think that I think I was under the impression, I think several of us were, that, you know, it was really kind of more of a Nebraska Tennessee picture, you know, after the visits that he was deciding to take during the dead period recently. And that's what we were all led to believe. I mean, we've we've all heard that. We, and even the national guys reported that, that it looked like this was coming down to, you know, Rocky Top or Lincoln. Um and and it just doesn't seem like um to me, you know, like there's been a, a huge like follow up with him where you feel like Nebraska could um, overcome the you know the lack of overall visits, the lack of overall connection. I think with the staff based on that, on on just not having a chance really to kind of recruit him the way that they would have wanted to if they were in the picture earlier and sooner and had him on the campus a few more times. So I I, I think it's I think you start weighing the factor of, of distance here. I think you start weighing the factor of where he's been a few more times, and, and that comes into play. Now, now with Terry, I think it's a little bit more interesting. Now, you don't like the fact that, obviously, UT is just 100 miles up the road from him in San Antonio. I mean, that's, that's, one, of the, that's one of the biggest things Nebraska is going to have to find a way to kind of get over. But I think that, you know, Nebraska has got really kind of a – an interesting take with how they want to use him, you know, offensively. And I think Oregon's been talking about more of a kind of seeing him as like a flex style hybrid tight end, which 
might make some sense because they just lost their tight end commitment to, to Tennessee and maybe they're trying to trying to figure out how things would work if they could get another another guy like him, you know, in the class. But um I think Nebraska sees, you know, Terry just doing huge things. I mean, I, like I said, I, I've used the I've used the comparison before. I'm not I'm not shy about it. I mean he, he looks a lot like a, a young Debo Samuel. Mm. He is a very, very tough, very multi layered kind of guy that can have impacts for you, you know, in the wildcat, running various places, being a ball carrier, you know, he can do so much for you on that side of the football. I think that that just takes all this tremendous pressure, you know, off of guys and off of positions when you, when you've got injuries in a room and you want to throw a, throw a guy over there to kind of help balance things out. Terry could do that for you. Terry could absolutely be that kind of guy that could help you balance things very, very quickly. He's got his hand on the scale uh, when it comes to the offensive rooms, and he could make things, you know, really, really fun to watch and really fun to kind of plan for if you were like on the Nebraska offensive staff. Um, so I, I think he's like a Debo Samuel kind of guy. Um, Again, you don't want to be against Sarkeesian, particularly when a guy is in, in, in inside the state of Texas. When the when, look when in, in strict knows this, when guys grow up in Texas and uh, one of the in-state schools wants them, um, they're tough. They're hard to get away. They're hard to get out of the state. Um, so I I, I kind of feel like you know the chances still might be the best with Terry, but I think ultimately he ends up a Longhorn and Sanders. I'm a little bit confused on kind of thinking more and more it's going to be Tennessee. Uh, I think Nebraska is running in that, in that third, third place or so with him, but you know, it's, you know, and I think obviously Will Hawthorne too is probably set to make an announcement here in a week, in a week or so. Um, I don't think things are trending in a very good way with him. I think things are trending in a good way. We're like with Isaiah Mosey. Um, and then, you know, Christian Jones is going to make a decision here in about uh, five weeks. Or, or so, yeah. uh, and that's an interesting one to kind of keep an eye on too. Especially if Nebraska misses out on Hawthorne, it really kind of puts that put, it makes a shift there about like what other linebackers could Nebraska potentially add to the class. Let's bring it to to a year out from now, Brian. Twenty twenty six's recruiting class. Uh, does even yep. Walker, running back, you, you wrote about uh, for Husker Online? Uh, definitely recommend people check it out. What's the skinny on Does even Walker? I think Nebraska is in a great spot with Walker. Um, I think that Nebraska has clearly got him targeted. Uh, he's from Raymore Peculiar uh, High School in in, in Missouri. Uh, played played with um, oh gosh, I just had his name on the tip of my tongue. I just saw his picture. Uh, uh, Jaden Doss just hmm. played played high school football with Jaden Doss, so they they've known each other for a very long time. Um, I think Nebraska really likes him, and his speed is a little bit it's a little bit misleading. Like if you go out there and you find his track times, I think that like he was like an 11 flat guy, which I couldn't run a 40 in 11 seconds. Let's be <laughs> honest, but, but I it's mean, in terms of like, yeah, but yeah, but in terms of like, you know, guys at that position, you know, you're looking for, you know, you're looking for those, those 10, those 10, six, 10, seven, you know, and if you can get them faster than that, then great. But, but Walker's going to be like an 11, 11 flat track guy, but you put him on film and there's not a lot of dudes that can beat him to the edge. He is incredibly quick. So he has a different kind of game speed, film speed that um, doesn't really like maybe translate, you know, all that well to track. It, it, it definitely it lights up. It lights up though when you put on his huddle and you can see it right away. He's a difference maker. Um, so 5'10", 180 ish, you know, he's been in Nebraska two, three times. Um, he's talking about coming back again for the Colorado game. And I think that that's one of the things I was just actually talking, talking about what I was going to do my three and out on, you know, on Wednesday is that the Colorado uh, evening uh, recruiting uh, experience is going to be huge. You know, Nebraska just wrapped up, you know, their summer with the junior, the, the elite junior day. Um, that last weekend in July, mostly, mostly all of those 2026s uh, all said they were coming back for, for, for Colorado. How huge is that that Nebraska can get back, 
you know, those guys that are incredibly critical to the, you know, to the success in the 2026 group, basically twice in six or seven weeks. That that's a, that's a huge thing for Nebraska. I mean, they, they're really establishing something with that group, you know, whether they're in state or, or right there in the radius, you know, and uh, I, I think that that's, that's huge. And, and Walker's absolutely a big part of that feeling that I have when it comes to Nebraska and, how, and what they're doing for the 2026 class. Another guy you wrote about for 26 in the defensive backfield, uh, JJ Dunnigan Jr. What do we need to know about him? Um, you know, wanted to meet Coach Butler. You know, obviously the change has impacted him. Wanted to kind of see what what he was all about. He's done some. He's done the right research. He's, you know, he knows that he's a guy that's been at the professional level. He's been at the collegiate level. He's worked with all pro guys, you know, and and we went around and round about it because I was like, oh yeah, I'm a Bills fan, so I I know who exactly <laughs> who you're talking about. Um, and Dunnigan, you know, really wanted to see like where Nebraska felt like he could play and they and they do feel him playing as a cornerback i think that that was music to his ears um you know he is a manhattan kansas guy so you know, obviously the wildcats will be you know definitely trying to do their best i think nebraska was really a thorn in the side of the jayhawks and the, the wildcats uh for the 2025 class getting guys out of kansas um and getting guys away that i feel like you know kansas you know in kansas state felt like they should get um, whether you're talking about like, uh, you know, like I, I'd say Jackson Carpenter was a guy that number one, Kansas had high, had very high on their board or, or a ped shock, you know, mm. K-State felt like they had a really good shot at him. I think for Nebraska to go into like a Manhattan and really kind of, you know, stake a claim on a guy like Dunnigan would be huge. But I think he's one of the guys that talked to me about coming back, um, for the Colorado game. So, uh, I, I think he's a really long corner. He's got some really nice interest out there for him already. And Nebraska's in a really good spot for him. Last thing then, Brian, your your, your colleague at Husker Online, Sean Hall- Callahan, posted a picture today, a throwback picture of Bubba Starling, right from that same uh, area down at Gardner Edgerton. And this is just, you know, worlds colliding as a Royals fan myself. I, I haven't thought about Bubba Starling in years. So to see this picture pop up, what do you remember about the Bubba Starling recruitment for Nebraska? And what could he have been at Nebraska had he seen that commitment through instead of going to play minor league baseball? I remember, man, it's such a mixed bag of emotions because Bubba was not the guy that you could, he was probably the first like regional player that I had like the most difficulty trying to get on the phone. He just was not, he was not that, he was not that kid. He was not the kind of guy that was going to answer the phone. He was not the kind of guy that was going to return your phone call. I I imagine he was extremely busy, but I had to work his network basically to get updates on him. And everybody just absolutely gushed about how great of a kid he was. And it was just, there was this kind of, it wasn't really like an opinion, like, Oh, well, if he's so great, like, why doesn't he get on the, on the phone with me? It wasn't anything like that. It was just like, the great ones that I remember talking to, like personally, you know, they were the ones that I was on the phone with, like Dawson Merritt. He will go down with me as one of the greatest interviews that I will ever, ever take place or, or, or have ever conducted, you know, and there's several other guys like that. Tim Tebow, mm-hmm. Tim Tebow will go down on that list too, of guys that I've talked to before in the past. that will just be like some of the most memorable people. If, if Bubba would have had that opportunity, I think with me to, to do that, I would have it would have really like changed this conflicting thought I've always had about him, you know, kind of looking back at it all, but tons of potential, tons of what could have been. I know that he kind of played it all out very late into the process to kind of secure a better signing deal with, with the Royals. It, it really soured on a lot of people. Um, that's what I kind of remember about all that, but in, an immensely talented individual that just, you know, just, didn't work out for and and maybe we shouldn't be surprised if he shows back up again some other day you know wearing a collegiate uniform but maybe not playing the quarterback position because he would have been competing with uh like late taylor martinez and early tommy armstrong correct i think that that's about the right timing well tommy was I just watched the Capital One game, and then that was the end basically of martinez's career the beginning of tommy yeah like that's about right. Yeah. 
No, that's I think that sound that does sound right. Yeah, that's probably that's probably about the right the right group of, of it. I mean, tough group to crack, right? right? I mean that that's Tommy Tommy took it by storm, if you guys can remember. I mean, by the time that Martinez and his ankle had kind of been done and stuff like that, Tommy was really on a on a on a high note, like going into the Capital One uh, the or excuse me, the Tax Slayer Gator Bowl or Cap it was a Gator Bowl. Yeah, so Gator Bowl that year. Yep. Yeah. So I mean he was riding high. I mean, and, and really had shown some stuff that, you know, as a true freshman, he was really, really doing some fantastic stuff. I mean, that would have been a tough, that would have been a tough one to crack right there. So it, it kind of depends on, on whether you look at the, the decision to go pro and play MLB and, and not making it versus maybe going to Nebraska and getting uh, jumped by another true freshman by the time it was your turn to kind of take it over. Awesome. Brian, appreciate your insight. As always, we'll uh, keep monitoring the countdown to fall camp. Hope to have you back on next week and uh, preview what uh, could be in store for Nebraska in the season. Sounds good, guys. We'll talk to you soon.